Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the risks of secondary malignancy after thyroid cancer treatment. Okay, we're going to get started. So, uh, Dr. Blumain, I'm going to hand it over to you, and you could do a quick introduction of yourself, and we'll jump right in. My name is Eric Blumain. I'm uh, in my last year of radiation oncology residency at Stanford University. I also uh, serve as a patient advocate for thyroid cancer. I might have just seen some of you at the last session, so welcome back, or nice to meet you, depending on how it may be. Uh, I'm going to start by um, laying out some definitions. Um, and so we're talking about secondary cancers after thyroid cancer treatment, um, which is obviously a really unfortunate thing to happen. But, uh, you know, I think, um, you know, there's a lot of misconceptions about kind of terminology. So uh, for purpose of this talk, I'm going to say that, you know, the primary cancer is the thyroid cancer that was treated. Um, assuming treatment was successful, um, that patient goes into primary, I'll say remission, or you used to say kind of their monitoring stage, you know, anyone that's gone through this or anyone that's has some healthcare experience knows that these terms like cure and remission and things like that are pretty loaded terms. Um, I'm going to give, we can have a kind of a whole talk on what those mean, but, um, yeah, for purpose of this, you go through your first treatment, things go well. And then, um, but if things don't go well, there's kind of two scenarios. One is a recurrence of the primary tumor. And, you know, technically, I guess that is a second cancer, secondary cancer, because it's kind of after the treatment for the primary, but it is a recurrence of the same cancer. So for purposes of this talk, we're going to be talking about a second cancer completely unrelated to the first that arose as a result of treatment. Uh, in this case, it kind of grew one in the salivary gland, but it, it you know could be anywhere, but just to demonstrate not the thyroid and not thyroid cancer coming back in a different area, um, a specifically new cancer that was not involved in the primary um, thyroid cancer, this is actually a really interesting stat that I just came across this year that I've been using a lot. Um, thyroid cancer is the second most common cancer among young people. Um, you know, I think we talk a lot about thyroid cancer. It's obviously every, anyone, this is kind of a biased sample of an audience that if you're at a thyroid cancer survivorship network meeting, it probably has some personal meaning to you, but, uh, you know, in the wider oncology community in which I find myself working, um, thyroid cancer sometimes can be considered kind of a niche thing. Uh, so I think it's very interesting to say that, you know, um, among young people, thyroid cancer is the second most common cancer. And just take a moment to kind of understand the implications of that. It's extremely, extremely common. So then therefore, even relatively rare events that can happen post-treatment are also possible because there are lots of survivors. Because fortunately, I think many of us know that most thyroid cancers are pretty good actors in the terms of cancer. Now, that's not to say that thyroid cancer is the good cancer, because that's one of my least favorite sayings. It's just to say that in the scheme of things, we do pretty well as a group, um, including myself among you. Um, and so uh, if you have, on the one hand, a disease that affects lots of young people, and on the other hand, you have a disease with which there are many long-term survivors. You can imagine that there are lots and lots of years of follow-up in the like in the world, in the community that have accrued. And so the problem with that is that second cancers increase over time. They're almost exclusively a disease of long-term survivors. Uh, and so um, if you take these two terms together, these two facts that thyroid cancer patients are young and they live a long time. Again, these are both generally good things, uh, but in this one specific area, uh, that can lead to a problem in the sense that uh, it does lead to susceptibility to a secondary cancer. Uh, we're going to go through this data in more detail, but this is more just to show that if you look, you know, there's very few even before 10 years and, um, you know, up to 40 years, there's a kind of a more substantial um, proportion of patients that have it. Um, you know, one thing I'm going to come back to a lot, so I will start doing it now, is that, remember, people focus on the risk of second cancer as if it's all or nothing. Um, and to some extent it is. You either get a second cancer or you don't. But uh, it's really more accurately discussed as a relative risk above your background risk of getting cancer. Unfortunately, you can see people that did not get RAI in the red curve, or some we didn't know, but mo most of whom did not get REI, um, you still have about a 15% chance of getting cancer at 40 years. And that just is kind of the background population risk. Um, so really the, the, the more meaningful number is what is this delta? 
it's not like you have a 20% chance risk of getting a second cancer. It's more accurately determined, um, considered in this background population risk. So that makes it kind of challenging to talk about and challenging to conceptualize for patients. Um, what is that relative risk increase? And so thyroid cancer, to summarize, is a disease of young people with excellent survival, which is potentially a setup for secondary cancers. And so here's an outline of what I'd like to talk to you about today. Uh, I'd like to talk about the current data on secondary cancer risk. I'd like to talk about the impact of those secondary cancers on survivorship. And then I would like to kind of have a very kind of focused discussion about what it actually means to survivors and kind of principles of management from both the doctor and the patient perspective. So we'll start with uh, the current data. Um, those of you who went to my last talk know that I try to ground things in data. Um, I think it's useful to summarize the main treatment modalities for thyroid cancer. Um, it, in many cases, is a surgical disease where you cut the tumor out. Uh, then sometimes external beam radiation is used. It's fair, that's what I do uh, in terms of my residency training and what I'm hopefully going to do for a career. Uh, it's somewhat rarely used in thyroid cancer, but it is used. That's aiming a beam of radiation right at the spot you want it to treat. Uh, there's also, though, radioiodine, which for purposes of thyroid cancer is very common, where you give a pill, it travels all over the body, and then it enriches in the thyroid gland and the thyroid tumor, which has unique biology that concentrates iodine, and that's kind of its Trojan horse to let the radiation in, and then it kills the cells. And so I think it's useful just to define these because we're going to be talking about these as we go forward. Uh, I showed these risks, uh, one of these curves before, um, and so... Um, these are again, secondary cancer risks, um, in the time, like in terms of cumulative incidence. So, um, it's a little bit complicated in the sense that, um, how long we follow the patients is kind of like a little bit confounding. Cause like, you know, we, the further out you go, the lower numbers you have. So you kind of become less and less confident in your data, the further out you get. Um, but on the left, we have, um, the, the incidence of, uh, like, liquid tumors, which we would say like hematologic problems, like lymphoma, leukemia, that kind of thing. And on the right, we have solid tumors. Um, and you can see the solid tumors are, uh, are much less um, of a risk in, in this population. Um, and so it's also important to note that because we're talking about RAI, that there have been some key developments in the last uh, 20 years or so where we're giving RAI less frequently. Uh, so this is a, some, some nice data that shows RAI use over time and in various sizes of cancers. Um, and then those two lines in the sand are uh, associated with the American Thyroid Association guidelines, which recommended against uh, RAI for low-risk cancers, and then were revised in 2015. So you can see there's been a steady decline in RAI, RAI use, um, which we'll get to kind of what that means in terms of patient management. But... Suffice to say, less patients are getting it. Uh, we were probably over-treating some patients in this window. That's kind of the thought process. Uh, but the flip side of that is that there's a large hump here of patients that were getting this treatment that under the modern paradigm maybe wouldn't be. And now these pa patients are at risk of secondary cancers. And since the risk can go up 40 years, we're not seeing them yet. So, you know, someone that got it in 95 were probably just now in the kind of the meat of their risk of secondary cancers. So all that is to say that this is a problem that is likely to continue to uh, manifest itself as we go forward. Um, you could kind of see from the um, from the curve I just showed you that um, it looks like again that kind of the the longer out you go, kind of the the more tumors you see. Uh, that's what this is meant to show the follow up time, um, but also. Um, younger age of treatment, which again, probably is a bystander effect for um, longer lifespan, because the younger you are when you get it, you know, you're less likely to die of other causes. And so you can see that, so the, the further to the right you are, the more the risk. Uh, again, these are relative risks. So you have, for instance, like, a, you know, um, a, like roughly like between one and 2.4% or so like increased risk. So from roughly the same to about two, it's kind of the st statistics. Um, and so, you know, again, this is perhaps not surprising. It's kind of saying the same thing we just said in a different way. Um, it's worth noting on those curves, I showed you that again, um, kind of lymphoma and, uh, leukemia type diseases were the most at risk. You can see maybe again, about like a one to two, um, like 1.5 or so, like maybe 
added risk, um, again, above the background risk. So again, we're talking above this background risk, which already exists. Um, and then similarly, when you look in Korea, a Korean study, um, they showed that they compared, so they had kind of their national database of cancer incidents, and then they looked at patients that got secondary cancers from thyroid cancer treatment like that, and were kind of able to like compare the risk between the background. Again, it's all in context of this background risk. So, a, so these numbers are kind of your, your relative risk on top of background. And so um, they showed that you, there was a, an increased risk of um, hematologic malignancy, which is here, but I, I kind of wanted to show that this solid can, so these, these numbers being less than one mean that was not statistically significant. So there wasn't an increased risk of solid cancer. Um, there was an increased risk again of leukemia and lymphomas, which uh, hematologic cancer, which is congruent with the other uh, study. And then that drove an effect in total cancers. But you can see this isn't driving the effect. So I think the hematologic cancers kind of showed an effect overall. And again, perhaps not surprising, you do see an effect of dose and age. So dose, you know, the higher up you go, the more the incidence. So, you know, when you get above 200, um, the risk became comparatively higher. And then kind of, there's a dose response, the lower you go. Uh, interestingly, they saw something that were like young, younger patients that got it had um, lower risks of secondary cancer, which I think is in interesting because it doesn't quite agree with the data in the last paper I showed you. However, that paper didn't look in patients 60 and older. So um, we might be seeing some kind of an effect of age that was, it's not exactly an apples to apples comparison that maybe we kind of know that older patients with thyroid cancer do worse. So I think that might be a surrogate for maybe they got higher doses. So then maybe they got more cancers. I don't think that this age effect is real, but it is what they showed. So uh, again, kind of like signposting it, it's like the leukemias are at risk. Um, and this is a very similar study. This compared uh, American data, national database with Euro, uh, Europe uh, national database and showed that um, when they combined the two to get kind of more numbers and more statistical power, they showed something very similar to the Korean data where they saw an increased risk of leukemia. They didn't really see an increase in any of the individual solid cancers, um, but they did see an overall risk in second cancers. Again, probably driven by the leukemia. So uh, what's kind of emerging is again, these kind of central kind of truths that um, you see an increase in these hematologic cancers, a, a borderline increase in other cancers, um, and that dose and time of follow-up and to some extent age are kind of prognostic factors in dictating that risk. Um, and you know, it's nice in a lot of ways that these studies all kind of agree and, and there's, there's lots of data on this. Um, I mentioned that I'm a radiation oncologist in training and so we use external beam radiation a lot. Um, this is a study about thyroid cancer patients who got external beam radiation and what their risk of second cancer was. Um, they did show a barely statistically significant increase um, in the um, probability of a second cancer. Uh, again, keeping in mind the background risk is, um, is still like kind of the main driver of, of risk and that little added incremental increase is what we're talking about. And so that makes it challenging to talk to patients. Uh, this is a common conversation we have in our clinics. Uh, you know, we have to give the rare risk of, of secondary cancer. And it's like, do we tell them it's 1%, less than 1%? Um, you know, there's some data in external beam radiation that's more like one in a thousand, maybe five in a thousand. Um, and again, typically decades later. So, you know, the patient's kind of prognosis comes into play. But again, we're talking about a disease with very, very excellent long-term prognosis. So these are things that we, as thyroid cancer doctors and patients, need to actively be thinking about. So the risk of secondary cancers following thyroid cancer increase over time. Again, this is kind of working against us that this is a disease of young people and long survivors. REI treatment increases the risk of second cancers. Um, there's a stronger association with hematologic malignancies versus solid tumors, but both are probably increased. And age and dose appear to be factors in determining that risk. And so I want to kind of change gears now and talk about the impact that that has on, uh, on survivorship. Um, I think, you know, again, this is a 
central concern that a lot of patients have when they go into treatment is what are the long-term effects going to be. These conversations can be tricky because a lot of young patients with cancer uh, can um, be worried that they're prone to a second cancer because clearly something went wrong early in their life the first time. So do they have a DNA defect? Do they have a genetic syndrome? And so these can be really like kind of burdensome emotional uh, baggage for survivors to carry. Um, and so hopefully some of the data I'm going to show you in the next couple of slides will kind of um, let you know that, um, bring you along to this idea that secondary cancers are a main kind of driver of quality of life among survivors. Um, you know, again, I, I kind of rail against this good cancer thing that some doctors will say about thyroid cancer. Um, I think it comes from like kind of a misguided attempt to like cheer someone up that like, if you had to pick a cancer to get like, this is the one, but like, who would, that makes, that, that sentence is kind of nonsense. But anyway, <laughs> I digress. Um, it's interesting though, to note that thyroid cancer, despite excellent outcomes, the survivors do not demonstrate better quality of life than cancers with significantly worse prognosis. And, um, and so you would think that if we're living a long time and we are doing pretty well, uh, that we would have a good quality of life. But unfortunately, the data, at least in this study and some others, bear out that actually it's worse than some cases. Um, and, you know, I'm sure the reasons for this are multifactorial. But um, one key driver that was shown uh, among these quality of life studies is that um, patients are fearful of a secondary cancer almost as much as or even potentially more than, I mean, that, depending on how much you want to read into the stats of their first cancer coming back. It's almost like the unknown is worse than the known. It's kind of like, I know kind of the gig now with thyroid cancer. I'm not, not my first rodeo, but this other, you know, leukemia waiting in the wings is like the scariest thing I could think of. And, and so indeed in that study, the fear of a second cancer was a main emotional driver of uh, quality of life. And you can see some of the other stuff, um, uh, including withdrawal from thyroid hormone. So keep that in your back pocket because I promise I'll tie that back in. But anyone that's gone through that kind of knows that, um, well, I actually can't speak from personal experience, but I've seen how bad that can be. So um, just file that away because I promise it'll tie back in later in the talk. But all that is to say that fear of second cancer is uh, is a main driver of quality of life. And so I will say that this is not something that gets routinely talked about in uh, follow-up visits, in kind of support groups. Uh, you know, I'm hoping that this uh, kind of um, fear underlying survivors is hopefully going to generate some good discussion among us today, because uh, I'm just going to be honest, I learned a lot about this topic preparing this talk. This is not uh, something that even I was routinely like kind of familiar with the data. Uh, so I'm grateful for the opportunity to have kind of taken a dive on this to be able to, to share some. Um, but right, so how are we doing as a healthcare system in addressing these fears? Uh, I would argue probably not well if like the quality of life is what it is, as we just saw and being driven by this. And so I think that's like a nice segue. I know the um, bullet point two is kind of short, uh, but hopefully I've demonstrated to you now that there is an impact on survivors of this. And I think it's a nice segue into like, okay, now what do we do about it? Um, if you look at unmet needs among survivors, uh, so again, these are patients essentially that felt that their health care team did not meet these needs or didn't provide them with resources for this. Um, you can see that um, these like, especially like fear of recurrence, which again is not quite the same as fear of second cancers, uh, but you know, up to 10%. And so if anything, this is more in the wheelhouse of a normal oncologist dealing with fear of recurrence. Only 9% of patients um, said that they received those. Um, so sorry, th these are, um, these are actually, sorry, the percent of patients that received um, this intervention. So very, very few. Uh, I think I misspoke when I initially um, introduced the slide. So you can imagine that a more niche topic like secondary cancers would be even less than that. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I will say this is something that um, we are probably lagging behind in. Uh, I wanted to take a quick note to kind of give a plug to FICA. I think it's a great organization. I mean, wouldn't be volunteering to speak with you right now if I didn't think that. Um, it's been really great to be involved at all levels as patient, speaker, 
support group member, all of the above over the years. I think this is something where like hearing from someone's experience that's gone through it could be very helpful. Um, I think that talking about our fears and needs as survivors that are unique to this population is very helpful. Uh, I didn't quite put it here, but there is also um, a burgeoning field of psych oncology, which are specially trained psychiatrists and other professionals, psychologists, um, some even oncologists that are not tr classically trained in psychiatry, who are learning about these very specific um, psychological processes processes that are going on among cancer survivors and kind of mobilizing uh, resources and strategies to help this unique population. Um, I actually entertained the notion of doing that at one point. So I really, I think that's like a really, really interesting field. And so I think it all speaks to this large unmet need. Um, in terms of what else to do about this, aside from meeting these needs, uh, both with existing and developing um, resources, I think we need to continue to follow the evidence-based guidelines to use RAI appropriately. I mentioned that there were these two kind of landmark um, um, guidelines, which came out, uh, which kind of advocated against using RAI in low-risk differentiated thyroid cancers. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't also mention the NCCN guidelines, uh, which are kind of a, a group that um, has guidelines for treatment of every cancer, and they do have thyroid guidelines as well. And I will say though that both the guidelines from the ATA, the American Thyroid Association, and the NCCN essentially agree in uh, their risk stratification and there are minute differences, but essentially uh, both bodies recommend uh, kind of treatment de-escalation in low-risk patients um, in large part because of these uh, non-trivial long-term risks. Um, I'm just gonna give some examples. This is, I believe, from the ATA guidelines. Um, and so, um, actually, sorry, I believe this from the NCCN guidelines, excuse me, but um, either way, you kind of get the idea of these low risks that like that last slide looked at size, but there's other factors too, whether or not it's intrathyroidal or outside, whether it's invaded the vasculature, whether there are lymph nodes, uh, whether there are thyroglobulin antibodies or thyroglobulin itself, we all kind of know these lab values having gone through this. Um, and then of course, a post-op ultrasound to look for uh, residual tumor in the surgical area. So if all of those are present, um, and it's a little bit confusingly worded because some of them are absent. So if not having antibodies is present, meaning if you don't have antibodies, then, uh, and all of those other factors, then we don't recommend uh, RAI. And then, you know, there are some higher risk cases that are definitely recommended, and then there's some gray areas in between. But you get the idea that there's risk stratification going on. And, uh, you know, it's okay to ask your doctor going in, um, you know, are you kind of following these guidelines? Are you, you know, treatment? escalating treatment to REI appropriately? Are you taking into account, you know, the secondary risk, especially among younger patients? Um, I, so I think that's one area where we can serve our patients. I promised I would bring in the uh, thyroid hormone withdrawal question back into it, and this, this is where it's coming in. So those of you who have gone through REI know that the two options are you can withdraw someone's thyroid hormone, um, or you can give them recombinant uh, thyroid, um, thyroid stimulating hormone. So the biology is, is as follows. The thyroid takes up radioiodine and iodine in general in your body. TSH as a hormone promotes that process. So there's two ways to get the TSH level high that we use in clinical practice. One is to withdraw someone's thyroid medication. Then your brain senses there's not enough thyroid hormone, bumps up the TSH, tells your thyroid whether it's there or not, some patients, you know, have, are post-thyroidectomy, the, the TSH goes up to, in order to try to tell the thyroid to do it. The thyroid can't comply because it's not there anymore. So the side effect of that is though you are deficient in thyroid hormone for a period of time. And those side effects can be rather debilitating. And so I mentioned, this is where I'm going to tie that back. The other option is to someone um, smarter than me figured out that you could just develop recombinant TSH, give it directly. Um, and so, um, whether or not the thyroid hormone is there or not, the TSH is now there. So you can keep someone on their normal dose of Synthroid or Levothyroxine or Cytomel or whatever they're on and just give them the TSH shots. And, you know, it's kind of a wonder drug in that way, um, you know, in, in concept. In practice, there's a lot more nuance to it. Um, but, you know, I think that 
the there's actually uh, have you ever heard the term? It's a feature, not a bug. There's a there's some concern among oncologists that because the TSH goes up so high so fast and then falls off so fast after the injection, versus when you withdraw some of these meds, it goes up slowly and then comes down slowly. Um, that you're decreasing the dose of iodine to the tumor. Um, because again, it's off so fast that all the iodine clears at that point. Um, and so there is data that it does clear faster and that it does reduce the dose. That has not led to oncologically worse outcomes. So while it's a theoretical concern that a lot of people will kick around when they discuss why they don't want to use it, uh, it hasn't really been shown to lead to worse outcomes. But where I say it's a feature, not a bug, is that it also decreases the normal tissue exposure to radiation. So now we've got this treatment that reduces side effects because they don't have to be hypothyroid. It is probably oncologically neutral. It probably treats the cancer just as well. And it may decrease the risk of second cancers. Um, for those of you who were in my last talk, I kind of talked about how like the, the, the interest of the doctor paternalistically deciding what's best for the patient um, versus what the patient needs. Um, I think that might be a play here because there are a lot of doctors that just don't like to use this because they think, again, it's like fast on, fast off. It's not good. But a lot of that's based on personal bias. And I would argue that two of the, the three main factors, again, which is like acute side effects, chronic side effects, and oncologic management of the cancer, Two of those three are better with this drug, I, I would argue. And I think one of the three is neutral, which is the treatment of the cancer. I think you don't withdraw some of the thyroid hormone and you potentially lower the risk of second cancers. So I think this is a very, very interesting um, sidebar to this uh, whole issue about whether or not it does treat the cancer as well. The fact that it treats the, lower, the, the normal tissue to a lower dose. And you can actually read through, through all of that, see the dose to blood was lower, Euthyroid group is synonymous with, we didn't take away the thyroid hormone, we gave them this. So euthyroid is, is thyrogen or thyrotropin alpha. Um, and so, yeah, they, they show that the blood dose was less. Um, and this was actually, I just have to take a moment to give a, a, a shout out. Um, Paul Ladenson is my, uh, was my endocrinologist uh, who got me through my RAI treatment. He is a real like gem of a human being and he's retired now, uh, but I think he's uh, hopefully still implying his expertise as like a consultant, but uh, to other doctors. But he he is uh, he is great, and um, hopefully he gets the message. <laughs> but yeah, he he um, he gave me thyrogen when I was a twenty year old medical student going through this. Um, I'm not sure to what extent he was thinking about second cancers. I know he was thinking about whether what what being hypothyroid would do to me in. Uh, it was actually undergrad. Sorry, at that time, excuse me. But what it would do to my undergrad and medical applications and things like that. Um, he was very mindful of that. So, uh, so I trust his, uh, opinion and he's a major proponent of this approach. Um, so, you know, there's also the possibility that in the future we'll, uh, we'll be able to detect, uh, secondary cancers right now. Uh, you know, we essentially have, you know, colonoscopies, mammograms, PSA levels, things that we would use for the general population. Um, but we don't have anything specific to second cancers. And we don't even have any specifically great non-invasive screening mechanisms, uh, like using blood tests, for example. So I am going to take a moment to kind of plug some of my own research that I'm hoping to build a, a lab program on someday, because uh, second cancers are something that I'm very interested in. Um, some of you may have heard of liquid biopsies or circulating tumor DNA or CT DNA. Um, this was uh, pioneered at Stanford and some other places. Um, we have a, a world expert in here, Dr. Max Dean. But essentially, tumors secrete DNA into circulation um, as kind of a biologic process. It could be related to cell death. It could be related to inflammation, any number of things. But you can actually detect that among a background of normal DNA. So, you know, you've got your blood cells, you've got your, your normal tissues are letting off DNA, but so is your tumor. And so if you apply a really rigorous uh, computer algorithm, you can detect the ctDNA in the blood. And so uh, I think there's a lot of work that can be done on what are the signatures of second cancers? Are there any specifics or the, these, these leukemias that arise? Are there specific molecular mechanisms that we can look at? And can we use uh, ctDNA to do that? Um, I have, you know, I'm hoping to build a lab program on ctDNA analysis for a variety of applications. Uh, this is one of them. 
Uh, you know, I will say this is the, the challenge of this isn't detecting the DNA. That's the easy part. The hard part is what do you look for? And right now I don't have that answer. I wish I did. But uh, yeah, these are areas where we can move in the future. Um, I mentioned this is actually a slide, although I changed the little, little circle, the red circle, but red rectangle, excuse me. Um, this is a slide from my last talk. Uh, we're talking about kind of how are we going to follow for these secondary cancers? How do we manage them? Uh, I mentioned we don't currently have anything better than what we do for the general population. But th that being said, um, there's a ton of value in really, really rigorous follow up. And whether that means uh, you know, getting yearly ultrasounds, if that's what your doctor chooses to do, physical exams, uh, some combination of the above. Um, I think it's really important for thyroid cancer survivors and cancer survivors in general to get really, really good follow-up. And so I show this here though, because, um, you know, from, again, from this digital health uh, advocacy talk I just gave, but this is a survey about what doctors thought about video visits. And if you look at, there are some things where, um, they thought the video visits did really well, but then there are some areas where they didn't think they did so well. And one of which, which is relevant to this talk, is the ability to success, uh, the, the ability to assess for complications of therapy. And secondary cancers would definitely be included in this. So, um, you know, your doctors aren't as confident in their ability to detect these things via a video visit. So while I think to some extent, if you had to drive five hours to go to an appointment to have your doctor tell you your thyroglobulin lab values look great, I think on the one hand, that's expedient and that makes a lot of sense. But if that was the only type of follow-up you ever got in 20 years, I think that's doing yourself a disservice. So I would argue that, you know, ideally there'd be some kind of hybrid approach where, you know, once every couple of years, an in-person exam versus, you know, kind of these video visits, uh, I think it argues for a judicial use of video visits, but a, a kind of deep dive into that's kind of outside the scope of what we're talking about, except to say that follow-up is very important in detecting secondary cancers, because unfortunately it's the best we have right now. Making sure you have your adequate screenings for the general population, making sure you're getting examined and followed by, you know, a good oncologist um, and really kind of maximizing your, your survivorship. And then of course, managing these other like emotional aspects of these fears of second cancers and things like that. So uh, I'm gonna now kind of uh, go a little bit um, lighter on this. And, and this is not dismissive. Please don't interpret these next few slides as dismissive. Um, so you might ask, what do you do about this risk? You've gone through your treatment. You know, in my case, I'm 15 years out roughly, you know, I think there's a lot you can do in your mind. Um, a lot of worrying, a lot of spiraling. Um, I think it's important to keep in context that, you know, these are all couched in the unfortunately, relatively high risk that we all have of getting cancer. Uh, and this additive risk that your treatment added, again, does not really bear out in the long-term data in the sense that thyroid cancer survivors and aggregate don't really do that much worse than the general population that don't have cancer. So that's all baked into that. So, you know, you could sit around and maximize every like fraction of a percent of chance you might have cancer and obsess over it and go down a rabbit hole. I will say I have done that. Uh, I don't recommend it. Um, and so uh, that's why I went with the Bob Marley approach for this slide. Um, I think I don't have that record, but I have one of them on vinyl. Uh, I have a Bob Marley record with this. And um, so, yeah, I think um, they're very serious. They're catastrophic when they happen, but they're very rare. And so, you know, I think that uh, it's kind of something that I would advise you to kind of, as long as you're in good hands with someone you trust, let your doctor worry about. Um, I remember about uh, probably about three years ago at this point, I went in to see a new oncologist. Uh, I moved to the West Coast, so I was establishing care. Um, Dr. Ladenson had retired. Um, my new doctor is fantastic. Um, she, I asked her at the end, like, well, now that I'm kind of in this survivorship mode, like, what second cancers should I expect? And she's like, why? You just want to worry about it all day? And I'm like, yeah, kind of. <laughs> so, but like, I, 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 I kind of took her, uh, her intent for what it was. And, you know, I really just asked the question so I would have something to worry about. And so uh, I was lucky enough to have someone that cared about me enough to know that she was not dismissing my question. If I really pressed her on it, like she would have told me, but I realized what I was doing because I had someone that kind of cared enough about me to tell me, look at the big picture and not the small picture. Um, there's lots of good things about survivorship um, and there are lots of real pitfalls. Um, this one, unfortunately, some of us may experience this, but uh, there's not a lot that we can do about it. Um, 
except you know treat it when it happens and try to detect it as early as possible. So um, yes, this is kind of the piece I've come to with it. Um, and so to summarize, uh, these are catastrophic events, but they're quite rare when you consider kind of the overall uh, additive risk versus kind of the background risk. I think the answer is close medical follow-up of survivors um, and management of all their issues, including kind of those quality of life issues. Uh, at the moment, there's not a great screening test beyond what's recommended. Uh, there's possibility for more advanced molecular screening, but again, we're not there yet. Uh, and so, you know, I hope this was informative and I hope if anything, I can kind of dispel some of the anxiety in the sense that, um, you know, it is a real risk, uh, but again, at an individual level, um, it's something that, you know, we all have to manage and um, hopefully I gave you some knowledge and tools to not fear the unknown quite so much. And then I mentioned, I said there were two slides where I'm not being dismissive, but I wanted to end on a lighter note. This is an example of, uh, oh, your Ebola test came back negative, but your stress ulcer needs treatment. So you can worry about these very rare esoteric things that can happen to you, but then a more common one hits you anyway. And so, uh, you know, it's kind of just a kind of part and parcel of what I was saying about uh, my conversation with my doctor about this issue. Um, and uh, I would like to thank the organizers of this and my fellow presenters. This is a great program that everyone's putting on. Um, I'd like to thank my department at Stanford and everyone that's kind of mentored me and taken care of me over the years and uh, all the various foundations that have kind of uh, given me an opportunity and a platform to learn about all of this and be able to bring it to you all today. So thank you. And I'm looking forward to any questions. And there are a lot of them. So we will try and get through as many as possible. Uh, the first one we have is what about risks for people with conditions like ATM mutations, um, ataxia, Mm -hmm. Telangiectasia. Yep. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes. So um, in those cases, uh, um, they're like that ATM is a um, DNA repair um, disorder, and that can lead someone to be more radio uh, sensitive. So, yes, in those cases, um, you know, it's understudied because it's a very rare condition. So, you know, it's already hard enough to track second cancers in a general population. So it's even comparatively harder to do that uh, in a small, in the subset of that population and with a rare disease. Um, I think biologically, it would make sense that the risk would be increased, but to what extent uh, it's, it's, it's hard to say. I think that would be something that would have to be carefully considered among the risks and benefits of giving the RAI upfront. So if I was seeing a patient like that, um, it would probably break a tie if I was you know, if they're in this intermediate risk strata where it's like we could do it or not, it might break the tie for me to not do it. Um, but every case is different. So it's, and unfortunately, there's not great data. Can you get a recurrence of a primary tumor if you've had a complete thyroidectomy? Yes, unfortunately, um, that can happen. Um, you know, it's again, kind of outside the scope of this conversation, but I'm happy to answer it. Um, the, um, you know, I it comes up a lot because it's like, oh, well, didn't I get the cancer cut out? Weren't the margins negative, which means there's no tumor left behind. And um, all of those things may be true, but there might've been, you know, some of these cancers grow almost like clusters of grapes or like little like multifocal tumors or, um, and then complicating that. So imagine if you have a cluster of grapes in your hand, that's the tumor that's got removed. And then imagine if you just, and they're like kind of like in a circle, but then you cut through like one part of the circle, like at the top, you may think you got it all, but then right below it, there might be in that wider part of the circle, there's cells that were left behind. So there's generally the, the thought would be that some microscopic cells were left behind one way or the other. Either the pathologist didn't see them because they weren't on the slide because of the kind of the, the spatial issue I just mentioned, or because the way the tumor grew just unpredictably that there were some microscopic cells left behind. And so that in that case, yes, even though you know you had a total thyroidectomy, tumors taken out, thyroid's taken out. Um, everything looks good, it could still um, come back. And that's, by the way, that's why RAI is given it. In most cases, it's given as an insurance policy um, to help eradicate some of those cells that might be left behind. Yeah. Um, okay, if you developed acute leukemia within six months of RAI reuptake trial for RAI refractory thyroid cancer using large doses of RAI, is it safe to assume that RAI had a role in the development of that leukemia? So a lot of the lead times are somewhat controversial. I think I've seen, there was one study, one of the studies I showed, they, they did the analysis both ways, both from time zero and from two years and showed similar results. 
So I think it probably it, it can happen early for the leukemias for uh, if you were saying this about like lung cancer or some second cancer, I would say probably not. But I think in that case, probably yes. I will also add based on the specific question, if it's kind of REI refractory disease using higher doses, it, they, you may, again, uh, every case is different, but in the event that you had had it before, and this is a retreatment, the previous dose could also have played a role. So, you know, this is like a recurrence now and we're treating it again. Yes, it could be six months from the new one, or it could be six months plus however much time from the old one. And in either case, um, but it, it could contribute. But yeah, I do not think it's impossible that the six months is too soon. And, and I think it's um, possible, but it's hard to know without reviewing the case, you know. Yeah. Uh, have you heard of the P10 gene mutation and it can and can it lead to other cancers? Um, I've heard of it being mutated in cancers. Um, so, but it's, um, I have not heard of it as an inherited cancer syndrome because, uh, this actually comes up somewhat commonly too. There's a, there's a distinction like that there's what's called germline mutations and there's tumor mutations. And what that means is, um, it's whether or not your normal cells harbor the mutation. So let me give you an example. So, um, a woman with breast cancer, she may have the BRCA mutation in her gene genetics. And that means she's, her and her family are predisposed to breast cancer. Uh, that's a germline mutation. That means that it's in her normal cells and the cancer exploits that to kind of grow. On the flip side, you can think of um, someone with a melanoma, they get a, a BRAF mutation it's called, which some thyroid cancer patients also get, but it's a BRAF mutation. That, to, that is generally not in the normal cells. That's something the cancer by nature of it being DNA damaged and growing quickly and things like that has acquired this mutation. And so just because you have one cancer with that mutation does not mean that that's in you like inherently that then would lead to uh, you being susceptible to other cancers with BRAF. Uh, and so I know that's a very like nuanced answer. Um, and that's not to say that there aren't familial syndromes with P10 mutations, but I'm not familiar with them. But I am aware of P10's role as a tumor suppressor and it is like mutated in cancers, uh, but again, more the tumor level rather than the germline level. So in that case, I would say in my understanding, which again, I say, I don't know a lot. I don't know exactly. I, I don't, I'm not familiar with any data that P10 has a germline cancer syndrome associated with it. What are some symptoms of stomach cancer possibly due to a secondary, due to a secondary cancer after thyroid cancer treated with RAI? And are there any unique symptoms of a secondary cancer a patient treated with RAI should look out for? That's an interesting point you bring up uh, because this is something that I was never, uh, that I recall anyway, counseled about when I got treated with RAI, but I'm seeing this more and more. Um, it started when I worked at Stanford here and I saw our doctors counsel patients on it. Um, it's possible I just forgot, but GI symptoms. Uh, it makes total sense. The radiation's passing through the gut. That's how the pill goes you know, up into your body. Um, but we're seeing a lot of GI toxicity in the sense that, um, you know, some, we'd say like gastritis, which is, you know, like, like indigestion, heartburn kind of symptoms. Um, there's actually been a whole host of GI symptoms from REI documented, um, in terms of what specific symptoms would be associated with second cancer in that area. It would be things like, um, kind of like early satiety, which is the sense that like, you eat one bite of food and you kind of feel full. Um, it could be some kind of painful swallowing, like in the sense that like food gets stuck if it's more in the esophagus, but specifically in the, in the stomach, um, be kind of more like indigestion type symptoms. Uh, but that's confounded by the fact that those are very common. So I wouldn't say those are alarm symptoms. Um, again, unfortunately, the challenge of this is that you asked, are there symptoms to look out for? And other than kind of anything new and concerning between you and your doctor, there, there's no like magic set of symptoms that are ringing alarm bells. Of, and, and that's part of the challenge of this, this survivorship issue. Uh, this person says, I will likely undergo um, iodine 131 uh, in a few weeks. As a radiation oncologist, will you explain the evidence supporting isolating at home rather than in a secure clinical location? Why should our family members who might be immune compromised be in the same house while our bodies excrete gamma radiation? Yeah, this is a, that's a great question. Um, I think there's like, I'll, I'll start, I'll clarify some things and then I'll go into your question. This is, this is a great question. Um, 
So the first of all, the immune issue, I'll start there. The radiation actually kind of affects people irrespective of their immune condition. Uh, granted, if they are immune compromised, they might have other health concerns that would put them at risk. But generally, the radiation dose would affect someone with and without an immune system equally. So the the guidelines for isolation don't change on the basis of immune status. So I just want to clarify that first. Um, but that, again, does not dismiss the concern that you're saying about like the bigger question, which is why are we not isolating? And so um, I think there's, uh, although we tend to gloss over this with patients in the room, there are actually calculations that are involved on kind of the safe, uh, the recommendations are very specific and they're grounded in measurements that are taken in the room, at least how we do it here at Stanford is that they're they're grounded in like patient activity measurements we take in terms of the radiation. And then we make specific recommendations based on time and distance on the basis of what like a worst case scenario would be. Um, that being said, um, you know, I think less is always more in this case. Like there's, you know, obviously less exposure to radiation is better than more in any case. So, um, you know, I think you could always counter argue like, well, why aren't we keeping patients in the hospital in isolation? Well, then you might get a hospital acquired pneumonia. And so like, right, there are always like pros and cons, but in terms of you on an individual level, spending as little time around your family as possible, like, I don't think that's unreasonable. Um, unfortunately, at least, especially in the Bay Area, most people live in like one bedroom places. It's like not really feasible for people to do that. Um, but yeah, I will say that at least how we do it here, we have calculations that we do um, that are involved in kind of how we make our recommendations and those are grounded in evidence. Um, but I will say when I went through it, I, I we had a, a kind of cabin up in the Poconos and I just hung out there by, basically by myself. My dad would come and eat dinner with me once a day and we would like sit far away for like a half hour and then he would leave. So, you know, we did it that way. So, I mean, there's a whole lot of right answers. There were very few wrong answers, um, but you're definitely not alone in having this concern. And uh, I'm glad it came up because a second cancer for us is bad enough, but a first cancer for someone we care about uh, on the basis of being exposed to us is is even worse. So, um, yeah, I think any more than that is kind of beyond the scope of what I even kind of know on this issue, but uh, hopefully that was helpful. Um, I had one periothyroidal node metastases, but otherwise low risk papillary thyroid cancer and was treated with 75 millicuries uh, in 2011 following the thyroidectomy. Uh, pan uh, precancerous pancreas cyst, side branch IPMN, was incidentally found in my pan pancreas nine years later. I'm wondering if there are, a, is there a connection of secondary cancers of the pancreas from RAI? Is there much data on this? Thank you. Uh, yeah, it's interesting. I, I had slightly more lymph nodes than you did, but I got treated with the same dose for a similar clinical situation. So that's interesting. Um, in terms of the specific question, you know, I showed a lot of the data there. There's not really any data that jumps out for a specific solid tumor. I think on aggregate, there's, I guess, a weak trend that there's more risk, but no, you know, I can, I can actually go back and show it if that's helpful, but, um, there's not one solid tumor that, that emerges as a clear association. I think if you look at all solid tumors together, there's a slight trend in that direction. I think the bigger, uh, trend is the leukemias. Um, but, you know, again, it's, that's not to say that, that um, these are all kind of population level data. So on an individual level, it did one cell in your pancreas, not like the radiation, so to speak, it's, it's, it's possible. It's just, it's difficult to draw conclusions um, on one case from aggregate. And so, uh, but yeah, my best answer is there's no clear association that's been identified, but that doesn't mean it's impossible. Uh, what about the value of genetic tests for hereditary cancer syndromes in general for things like P10, CHEK2, TP53, ATM, et cetera? Um, I think um, there are a couple um, things with that. I think, you know, there's, I think one isolated case of cancer in a family is generally not enough to trigger a genetic test. Um, I think, you know, kind of the, the pedigree is important in terms of looking at that. Um, I think, though, anyone with medullary thyroid cancer certainly um, warrants being worked up for multiple endocrine neoplasia syndromes. Um, that is a common um, syndrome that affects thyroid cancer survivors of that disease type. Um, but uh, again, there's not, you know, a single case of papillary thyroid cancer or differential thyroid cancer um, doesn't necessarily uh, portend a familial syndrome in the absence of other evidence. Okay. 
Uh, do you think CT DNA screening tests will eventually be offered to younger patients? The current tests are only offered to the 50 plus age group. As a YA patient, I'd love to have access to something like this post TC. Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's always about the, um, the false negatives and false positives versus true positives and true negatives that you expect in a population. So, um, so there's a lot of like kind of population health data that goes into those types of decisions because it's, be it, it's kind of counterintuitive, but it's better to order a test in a population of people that you think are more likely to have it than in a population that are less likely. The tests perform better the way the statistics would uh, bear out. There's a ton of like medical boards questions. They love to ask those calculations. <laughs> so it's something that I think most people that have gone through that are kind of familiar with. Um, and so, uh, but that being said, um, you know, for instance, you know, when you increase the, on that basis, the mammograms from 40 to 50, there's a very real tale of people that would get breast cancer in their forties that would be missed by that. So I think there's um, the kind of a need for advocacy and, and just, but really it'll be guided by the science. And I don't, you know, CTDNA is on the cusp, but it's not quite in prime time yet. Uh, I will say there's lots of exciting things happening. Um, I see it in lab every day, really. And, you know, there's a lot of people working on me there around me. They're doing really cool stuff. So, uh, but yeah, I don't think it's quite in prime time yet. And, but yeah, my, the vision would be, yeah, it'd be great if you can like, you know, you know, the 20 most common mutations in human cancers, you look for all 20. And if you see one, oh, well, what's that about? Then kind of prompts you to go look for something. So that's kind of how I see it coming in its first generation in terms of the screening test. Okay. There's a lot of questions and we have about six minutes left. Uh, what is considered a great thyroid globulin le level other than zero or undetectable? If you do not have a thyroid anymore and you have thyroid globulin, don't you still have cancer, especially when you also had RAI after your thyroidectomy? Uh, 28 millicuries as insur insurance to kill any residual cancer cells in the body. Um, yeah, that that's... Um, I'm Again, I get there's a lot of questions. That one's kind of off topic, but I'm happy to try to give it a give it a swing. Um, it depends on some details and just some concepts I'll lay out. Just again, in every it's impossible to answer a specific case in this kind of a format, but I'll lay out some some kind of concepts. Um, it depends on after the RAI what the thyroid globulin did. If it went to zero and then became detectable after that, that is slightly more concerning than if it went down to a level that wasn't zero and stayed there because there's always a little bit of remnant thyroid tissue left behind on the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Um, it's just unavoidable the way the surgeons have to do the surgery because otherwise they'll paralyze your vocal cords. And so the ablation should take care of that, but especially because although you, you know, you got an acceptable dose, but it sounds like a low on the low end, which again, for some of these issues might be a good thing. It's possible that some of that tissue is left. So the thyroid globulin doesn't distinguish between cancer and normal tissue. Uh, and sometimes that residual thyroid tissue can be detectable, especially with ultra-sensitive modern thyroid globulin tests. So the trend is what's most important. So if you're running at like 0.2, but you have been since you got treated, that's probably not worrisome. If you went to zero and now you're like 0.3, that might be worrisome. But again, it's it's hard to know. But those are kind of the the, the extremes I, I would lay out. Okay. Um, I'm trying to see if there are ones that you really haven't covered um, what is the risk for someone who already had breast cancer a few years prior to getting thyroid cancer and RAI treatment? I don't know. Um, that's a that's a tricky one. Um, you know, I think um, the breast cancer provided that there were, the, the patient got radiation, that is its own kind of risk of second cancers. And then the, the RAI would have its own, but those risks are kind of mutually exclusive in the sense that we wouldn't necessarily think that like the soft tissue that was largely irradiated by the breast would like become more additively at risk because it, that tissue got then you know, radiation from the external beam. Um, so, you know, I, I'd say that there's, they're, they're both incrementally increasing the risk independently, but I don't think they work synergistically uh, against you. Um, I'm currently prepping for RAI the week of September 26th at Stanford. Should I have an oncologist in addition to my endocrinologist and internist? Oh, uh, well, I might, <laughs> I might see you around, I guess, but, uh, yeah, uh, good luck. Um, I think, uh, you know, the endocrinologists here, um, again, it kind of depends on who you see, but also at a lot of academic centers, 
um, kind of subspecialize. And so as long as this is kind of an endocrinologist that um, sees thyroid cancer, um, a lot of times they will kind of take management and then they'll refer to the nuclear medicine doctors who actually administer the treatment. Um, but um, yeah, so, you know, I think in terms of additional oncologists, um, you know, we, we as radiation oncologists don't routinely see patients in that setting. It's more if the cancers come back. Um, and I don't think medical oncologists typically do either. It's, it's more like the, the surgeons and the endocrinologists kind of manage it up front. And then it kind of comes to us if things, um, things kind of recur or don't go well. I will say, you know, it's going to be an area of my career where I'm hoping to see patients earlier and be more actively involved in the management. Because I think there are patients with high-risk disease who could benefit from uh, earlier intervention with radiation, but um, you won't, you'll find uh, dissension in, in that. That's not a universally held viewpoint because again, this, every treatment has side effects. So, yeah. But uh, no, I think provided you have kind of one of the endocrinologists that specializes in thyroid cancer and, and uh, I think you're in good hands. Uh, we might just have one time for one more. Um, what's the difference between relative risk and background risk? That's a great question. So I, I use those terms a lot. So um, you also might hear absolute risk. So, okay, so this is something that's a good life skill because uh, you'll find that marketing people, sometimes news people, they'll use these numbers to manipulate your understanding of what's going on. So... If I told you that you'd have 50% increased risk of like dying in a car accident or something, you'd probably freak out, right? Like a, that sounds really bad. But what if it went from two in 10 million to three in 10 million? That's a 50% relative increase. It went from three to two. But on an absolute level, that's barely moves the needle. And so your, your relative risk of cancer uh, might be, you know, 50%, but maybe that's going from 1%, uh, from 2% to 3% or, or, or something, for example. So um, it's important to always think about like when we're talking about these things. Yeah. Like a lot of times studies look good. Oh, we saw, you know, a 70% relative risk reduction, but you know, it's kind of like then becomes almost like an academic question because like, it's so rare that you're barely on an absolute population level moving the needle. So, uh, so that's why I kind of try to think about things that the, unfortunately the background risk of cancer isn't zero. Uh, it's actually kind of substantial, of, and that's kind of why we're all here. You know, lot, unfortunately, lots and lots of patients get cancer, and so that the the stuff we're talking about today, that and what I'm kind of encouraging, being vigilant for, but not obsessing and worrying so so much over, is that is that incremental additive risk on top of that background risk. Um, and so that's where where we're at. Well, we are at 6.30, so I want to thank you, Dr. Blomain, for all of your insight today and for answering as many questions as we could get to. Um, I hope people are enjoying the conference and uh, I hope that they're learning everything that they need to learn from it. So thank you so much for your time today. Yeah, and thank you thank and for the introduction and the questions and thank the audience. Thank you. That, those were some great questions. And uh, I wish all of you luck for those of you that are about to go through treatment. And um, I know that a lot of you shared that and I appreciate that. And then those of you who've gone through it, um, good continued luck and good health. Thank you. All right. Take care. Thank you.